Mozambique has found gas, and lots of it. This southern African state, situated to the northeast of South Africa and the east of Zimbabwe, looks set to become a continental gas titan and could become the world's fourth largest exporter of natural gas, fundamentally transforming the country. In 2006, Italian energy giant Eni was granted a license to explore for gas off the state's northeastern coast known as the Cabo Delgado region. After five years of exploration, the company announced that it had discovered what it called supergiant resources in the Rivuma Basin off the Cabo Delgado coast that is now estimated to hold 2.4 trillion cubic metres of natural gas, setting the state off on an extraordinary economic journey that could change the country's fortunes, though the road will most certainly be bumpy and with many obstacles. Since Eni's 2011 discovery, oil and gas companies have moved into Mozambique in a big way. With Mozambique situated at somewhat of a crossroads in global shipping, liquid natural gas from the country can be shipped to markets in Asia across the Indian Ocean, to North and South America as well as West Africa around the Cape of Good Hope, and to Europe and North Africa through the Suez Canal. With demand for natural gas in the Asia-Pacific region expected to grow from 2020 to 2035, Mozambique is perfectly situated to supply. Due to its aforementioned geographic position, an array of international companies have taken interest in Mozambique, including Total, the French energy giant, the US's ExxonMobil, and Oil India, amongst other energy companies from the Asia-Pacific region. The Rivuma Basin that contains most of the country's gas reserves is situated 25 miles offshore of the Cabo Delgado province in Mozambique's exclusive economic zone and covers an area of 31,000 square miles or just over 80,000 square kilometres. The basin has been divided into two areas or blocks alongside four other areas of Mozambique's EEZ and work is currently being carried out or will be carried out in areas 1 and 4 situated over the basin. As a whole, the Rivuma Basin covered by Areas 1 and 4 is estimated to contain a massive 160 trillion cubic feet of natural gas reserves. According to the US's Energy Information Administration, as of July 2020, Area 1 of the Rivuma Basin is estimated to hold 75 trillion cubic feet of natural gas. Area 1 is operated by French company Total, who purchased Anadarko Petroleum's 26.5% stake in the Mozambique LNG project for 3.9 billion US dollars in 2019 after Anadarko was acquired by Occidental Petroleum. Anadarko, alongside its other consortium members, announced a final investment decision in June 2019 worth over 20 billion US dollars, kicking off the process of developing an onshore LNG facility with the potential capacity of 6.6 .6 billion cubic feet of natural gas per day. This investment was larger than Mozambique's $15 billion GDP. Alongside Total, various Mozambican companies have stakes in the area, as well as India's ONGC Videsh. Area 4, the area further offshore, is estimated to hold 85 trillion cubic feet of gas, ranking among the 10 largest gas discoveries in the world. ExxonMobil will lead the construction and operation of all future natural gas liquefaction and related facilities for the Deepwater Area 4 block, having a 35.7% stake in the block, 25% of which it jointly acquired from Eni in 2017, as part of the Revuma joint venture framework that has a joint 70% stake in Area 4. Alongside Exxon, Eni is also still involved, having a stake of 35.7% in the joint venture framework, as well as the China National Petroleum Corporation, which has a stake of 28.6%, and also other European and American oil and gas companies. The remaining 30% concession in the block is owned by three other energy firms from Portugal, South Korea and Mozambique. Exxon was expected to announce a final investment decision for Area 4 and the future of its onshore operations in 2020, however, this has been delayed until 2021 and will most likely be lower than what was initially expected, reportedly being forecast as 23 billion US dollars instead of the previously expected 33 billion US dollars. The Coral South liquefied natural gas plant in Area 4, operated by Eni, became the first plant in the basin to reach a final investment decision, or FID, with construction starting in 2017 and the first gas extraction scheduled for 2022. 
This plant will be floating due to the economic viability of building pipelines to the shore and will be built in South Korea. According to Africa Oil & Gas, the Coral South FLNG unit is expected to produce 3.2 million tonnes of liquid natural gas per year over an estimated life of 25 years. As of November 2020, Total and Exxon are reportedly looking to combine their efforts in the Rivuma Basin in the face of pandemic-induced low gas prices and Mozambique's worsening security situation. Mozambique's major gas find is expected to be transformative for the country. According to Bloomberg, the state expects to generate 95 billion US dollars of gas revenue over a 25-year period. As mentioned before, as of 2019, the country had a GDP of just over 15 billion US dollars, making the potential impact of the coming cash influx evident. How the country uses this revenue will determine whether or not it can successfully develop. Mozambique must think long term, laying the foundations for its successful development for when its gas eventually depletes in the distant future. To do this, it could look to numerous states that have successfully utilised their oil and natural gas finds, such as Norway, which has a sovereign wealth fund with over 1 trillion US dollars in assets, and the many states of the Persian Gulf, which have laid meticulous plans for the diversification of their economies away from oil. Mozambique is already considering creating a sovereign wealth fund, in which it plans to put 50% of revenue from the first 20 years of gas extraction. Once this initial 20-year period has passed, then 80% of revenue generated would be put into the Sovereign Wealth Fund, while the rest will go into the country's annual budget. The potential creation of a Sovereign Wealth Fund has been touted as a move aimed at making the benefits of the gas find multi-generational, and would be a sensible decision on the part of the state. Just as important, if not more important than a Sovereign Wealth Fund, is the development of the country's infrastructure, mainly in the form of public works projects, such such as railway building, road building and port building and expansion. By building critical infrastructure such as roads and railways, using revenue generated by its gas find, the country can increase domestic mobility and connectivity, in turn developing other sectors of its economy, something incredibly important for the future. Kicking off a process of economic diversification is essential for Mozambique. Moreover, the country must invest in the future for its burgeoning younger population, which can be done through the building of schools and other educational facilities. Alongside education, Mozambique can improve the general well-being of its population by building hospitals and investing in healthcare. Fundamentally, improving living standards for its citizens must be at the heart of the country's spending strategy for its potential gas-generated wealth. The two main LNG projects in Mozambique are also indirectly and directly expected to create tens of thousands of jobs for Mozambicans, regardless of revenue generated from the exploitation of gas itself. In a lesser developed country with an unemployment rate just under 25% as of 2020, the impact of gas projects alone will be significant, having knock-on effects for the Cabo Delgado region and beyond. All of this said, the road towards development and the position of the world's fourth largest exporter of natural gas has been, and will be, far from smooth. Much of Mozambique's projected development relies on pre-pandemic economic and more specifically gas market conditions, and the global coronavirus pandemic has directly caused uncertainty and delays in regard to the country's liquid natural gas projects. As lockdowns and other restrictions have caused a decline in economic activity across the world, oil and gas prices have also declined due to a lack of demand. With uncertainty and volatility in global markets, the large international companies involved in Mozambique's LNG projects have been hesitant to invest in new infrastructure, hence Exxon's delayed final investment decision for Area 4. In addition to pandemic-related gas market conditions, experts have also warned that the country could experience negative impacts from its LNG boom, arguing that the state must be careful if it is to avoid the so-called Dutch disease or oil curse that many other resource-rich states such as Venezuela have experienced. If the revenue generated from natural resource extraction is not used fairly to improve the conditions of Mozambicans, then the country risks instability, and there is more than ample evidence to suggest that this is already happening. Of most significance for its potential LNG-driven development by far has been the country's ongoing insurgency, mainly situated in the Cabo Delgado region, that most of the state's gas find is off the coast of. 
According to experts, this insurgency has been driven by many factors. Though a distinct lack of economic opportunity has been a major factor, something that the gas fine could and almost certainly will change, particularly in the Cabo Delgado region. The insurgency in northern Mozambique is somewhat obscure, with the status and nature of groups involved being slightly uncertain. However, the main insurgent group is known as Ansar al sunnah known locally as Al-Shabaab, with this group being in no way directly connected to the militant group in Somalia. Ansar al sunnahs activities can be traced back to 2015, and its ideology is rooted in its radical interpretation of Islam, introduced to the region by young former expats, who returned to the country having studied in Sudan, Saudi Arabia and the Gulf states. Ansar al sunnah claims that Islam as practiced in Mozambique has been corrupted and no longer follows the teachings of Muhammad. In the period leading up to the current insurgency, the group's members entered mosques in the largely Muslim Cabo Delgado region, threatening worshippers with weapons in order to convert them to the group's own brand of Islam, in turn alienating large segments of the population. Fundamentally, the division between the group's own Salafi ideology and the local Sufi interpretation of Islam would cause tensions. Over time, the group would become increasingly violent, calling for Sharia law to be implemented in the country, no longer recognising the Mozambican government, and began to form hidden camps across the Cabo Delgado region. A series of interrelated factors, including wide-scale poverty, lack of economic opportunity, social marginalisation, and seemingly vague promises of regional development through LNG projects have only served to fuel the insurgency in Cabo Delgado. Experts debate the extent to which the insurgency is based in a more international struggle centred in Islamic extremism or whether it is based in more local and national issues. This is still somewhat unclear today, and as always, the truth probably lies somewhere in the middle. However, a distinct sense of neglect within the Cabo Delgado region must be emphasised when talking about the insurgency. As many analysts have noted, the large number of disenfranchised, mainly younger males in the region means that Ansar al sunnah has a large base from which to recruit, and much of the group's rhetoric has been centred around the rampant inequality relating to the distribution of profits from previous and ongoing natural resource extraction in the area, directly addressing grievances within this group. The problem of economic and social disenfranchisement has only been exacerbated by the expropriation of land for natural resource extraction projects. According to Africa Center, the expropriation of land in other areas of the province for use by multinational companies has created consternation and social stress among the population, with some residents who were uprooted by the development plans complaining that the legal process was rushed, with both farming and fishing communities displaced in the process. Moreover, the Cabo Delgado region's role as a base for criminal activity has only added further fuel to the insurgency. Ansar al sunnah has reportedly raised funds through the sale of illegal timber and rubies, and also through poaching animals. Smuggling is also rife, with the area being a transit point for large shipments of heroin bound for South Africa and Europe. This is a very short summary, but it can be said that these factors are mainly responsible for causing the ongoing insurgency amongst numerous others. Though Ansar al sunnah has been active since 2015, its first major attack came in October 2017 in the city of Mosimboa de Praia, where its members attacked three police stations and its activities have since grown to threaten gas works in the region. From 2017 to 2018, the group would step up its activities, attacking government forces, prompting the government to begin counterinsurgency operations. In April 2018, the conflict took on a new dimension when the African Union confirmed the presence of Islamic State forces in the region. Since this confirmation, the conflict has taken on a different scope, with many now framing it within the context of the international struggle against extremist groups such as IS and Al-Shabaab. Throughout 2019, the insurgency would continue to intensify, with the level of violence escalating. In June of that year, Islamic State claimed that its Central Africa province branch had carried out a successful attack on the Mozambican army at Mitopi in the Musimboa de Praia district, in which 16 people were killed and 12 wounded. The alleged involvement of IS in the insurgency has since been picked up on by international media and was demonstrable of its growing international relevance for Islamic extremist organisations. In 2020, the conflict would again be taken to a whole new level. On the 23rd of March, Islamist militants seized the town of Mosimboa de Praia, but withdrew the next day. 
In April, the Mozambican government would admit that Islamic State elements were active in Cabo Delgado, and the insurgency would be subject to increased international coverage. On the 23rd of August, militants associated with the Islamic State's Central Africa province would again take Mosimbo at the Praia, later declaring it the capital of their province. This permanent seizure of Mosimbo at the Praia represented a huge blow to the government's aspirations of rolling back the insurgency. With the risk of national instability increasing, and with the insurgency spilling across the border into Tanzania, Mozambique would request international assistance to combat the burgeoning insurgency. In late September 2020, the Mozambican government requested European Union assistance in combating the insurgency, a request the EU would accept in the following October. In addition to the EU assistance, the US also requested neighbouring Zimbabwe assist in combating the insurgency. As of 2020, Tanzania and Mozambique have signed a Memorandum of Understanding in order to combine their counterinsurgency efforts, paving the way for joint operations. The Malawian government was also rumoured to be set to send troops to Mozambique for the purposes of counterinsurgency operations, however, this has since been denied by the state's government. The number of insurgents has been reported as between 3,000 to 3,500 by the Washington Post, and the number of monthly attacks has increased from 5 in October 2017 to over 49 in May 2020, averaging 24 attacks per month, demonstrating the growing scale of the violence. Mosimboa de Praia remains instrumental for unlocking Mozambique's gas resources, being a centre for supply for gas works activities before its capture, and the government has made significant efforts to retake the city, however, it still remains in the hands of the insurgents. Most notably, in January 2021, the insurgents came within half a mile of Total's onshore gas infrastructure, prompting the company to evacuate its staff. So far, the insurgency has largely been contained to the Cabo Delgado area, with the insurgents controlling Mosimboa de Praia and many surrounding towns. The exact areas of control are not known due to a lack of information and restrictions on journalists reporting on the conflict. Over half a million Mozambicans have been displaced by the insurgency, with many coalescing in larger urban areas within Cabo Delgado and other nearby provinces. Over 100,000 people have arrived in Pemba, the regional capital of Cabo Delgado, increasing its population by over one third, with many international organisations warning that the situation could rapidly deteriorate. These IDPs, or internally displaced persons, are in many cases reported to be living in unsanitary conditions, with a short of food facing an uncertain future. What we can say for certain is that in order to end the insurgency, Mozambique needs stability, and to achieve this, the state needs clear-cut rule of law. Once Mozambique has stability and rule of law, it can use the revenue generated from its LNG projects to address the economic and social roots of its insurgency. Fundamentally and paradoxically, the greatest obstacle standing in the way of ending the insurgency is the insurgency itself. As with almost any insurgency and counter-insurgency operation, the local populace must be brought on side, and Mozambique can more than achieve this by improving the living conditions of Mozambicans through health and infrastructure projects. So if Mozambique needs stability, how can it achieve this? The country has largely chosen to counter the insurgency through kinetic means, deploying its security forces to Cabo Delgado, as well as employing private military contractors, a strategy that has proven controversial. Mozambique's security forces have proven ineffective in combating the insurgency, and have been accused of human rights abuses, something the government claimed was the responsibility of Islamist militants dressed as its own personnel. If it is to succeed, Maputo must regain control of all territory lost to the insurgents, and as stated before, begin the process of winning over the local population through raising living standards, thus rooting out the main causes of the insurgency. However, this is easier said than done. Mozambique has turned to private military companies to assist in the kinetic aspects of the insurgency, as well as operational support and intelligence. In August 2019, according to the Jamestown Foundation, Mozambican President Felipe Nussi met with Vladimir Putin in Moscow and urged Russia to invest in his country, promising a wide range of lucrative deals and contracts. This development also came after a previous 2017 agreement between the two countries to increase military technical cooperation. 
After a bidding war which included Eric Prince's Frontier Services Group, Mozambique turned to Russia's Wagner Group to assist in its fight against insurgent forces and train local security personnel. In that same month, 200 Wagner contractors entered Mozambique to be deployed in Cabo Delgado alongside three helicopters. Following the deployment of Wagner to Mozambique, IS Central Africa Province would reinforce its forces in Cabo Delgado by rushing in fighters from other African countries and conflict zones. In the following October, Wagner contractors would be caught in two deadly ambushes that resulted in the death of seven contractors. According to multiple sources, Wagner was overconfident and underprepared to fight Islamic State in the tough terrain of Mozambique's bush, resulting in disarray. The company would endure a series of defeats in Cabo Delgado, losing 10 operators, eventually forcing it to withdraw most of its contractors in November amid growing tensions with Mozambican security forces over failed operations. Following the failure of Russia's Wagner Group, Mozambique has since turned to South Africa's Dyke Advisory Group. The Dyke Advisory Group, a PMC set up by Lionel Dyke, a former Zimbabwean army officer, has played an active support role in the conflict, mainly through the use of its helicopters. Being based in South Africa and run by Lionel Dyke, the Dyke Advisory Group has had a moderate amount of success compared to the Wagner Group due to its previous experience operating in bush environments, and notably, in combating illicit poaching within Mozambique itself. According to unconfirmed sources, the Dyke Advisory Group has so far deployed a number of helicopters, including two Gazelles, one UH-1 Huey, and one long-range helicopter, along with two other light aircraft. The company reportedly had a tough start to its operations in Mozambique, losing one helicopter to insurgent forces, as well as a reconnaissance microflight aircraft in June 2020. Despite some initial setbacks, the Dyke Advisory Group has been useful in preventing insurgent forces from taking strategic cities such as Pemba and aiding government forces to retake the town of Macomia from the insurgents. In July 2020, multiple sources reported that the Dyke Advisory Group has had its contract renewed by the Mozambican government, suggesting that it will continue to operate in a supporting role in counterinsurgency operations going into the future. While the use of PMCs in Mozambique has had some mixed results, arguably and most evidently, they are not the solution to ending the state's insurgency. If Mozambique is to continue the use of PMCs, it must be in a supporting role for its own security forces, which it must focus on equipping and training to a good standard. The moderate success of the Dyke Advisory Group, that has mostly been due to its previous experience operating in the bush of southern Africa, should serve as the model for the country's use of PMCs going forward. The best way for Mozambique to end its Cabo Delgado insurgency is through training and equipping its own security forces, while also ensuring a degree of international cooperation, and this is the view of a majority of analysts. Mozambican security forces have been undertrained and ill-equipped, leaving them in a poor position to fight the insurgency. The seizure of Mosimboa de Praia and the defeat of the country's security forces there serve to highlight their ineffectiveness. During the battle for Mosimboa de Praia, it was reported that the marines defending the port ran out of ammunition and were forced to flee by boat. If Mozambican security forces are to avoid such catastrophic defeats in the future, then their kinetic capabilities must be improved, and in particular, their counterinsurgency ability, logistical capability, and equipment. All insurgency is local, which is certainly the case in Mozambique, and thus requires local solutions. The political aspect of Mozambique's counterinsurgency operations will be as important as the kinetic, if not more important. To defeat the insurgency, the government must first strip it of its territory. By doing so, gasworks can go on unhampered in the Ravuma Basin, in turn injecting cash into the government budget, which can then be used to raise living standards not only across the country, but also in Cabo Delgado. Over 700 troops already guard gas facilities in Cabo Delgado, with the government signing a memorandum of understanding on security with Total after violent incidents involving its staff and insurgent forces. However, the government must be careful to manage the perception of the protection of gas facilities, emphasising the importance of gas revenue for raising living standards, and avoiding giving the impression that its interest is solely in protecting large multinational companies. 2021 will be a critical year for Mozambique.
If the country cannot stem the growth of its insurgency, it could again grow to a completely new level, becoming a focal point for larger jihadist organisations whose fighters could flood into Cabo Delgado. The nature and trajectory of Ansar al sunnas growth indicates that the group now has growing outside international support for its operations and activities, and that the group is beginning its own campaign to win over some of the local population through various financial and social incentives. As the insurgency grows in international relevance, Mozambique should look outwards too. The country must aim to grow regional support for its counterinsurgency operations, whether this be in the realms of kinetic or political support. Neighbouring Tanzania is an obvious starting point, and some movement between the two countries has already occurred. However, Mozambique must also work to get its economically larger and a militarily stronger neighbour South Africa further on side. The country must also try to build broader regional support from countries such as Nigeria, the Democratic Republic of Congo, Somalia and Kenya, all of which are currently embroiled in their own struggles against militant extremists that have transnational operations. As stated prior, the European Union, with former colonial ruler Portugal currently holding the six-month rotating presidency, has pledged its support for Maputo in October of 2020, stating that it will assist in training, logistics and medical services for forces that are fighting terrorism in northern Mozambique. The Union has so far sent 100 million euros for education, health and social protection purposes. Portugal itself has also pledged its assistance for Mozambique in combating the insurgency, having already established a line of dialogue with Maputo and used its position as the current holder of the EU's rotating presidency to push for an EU training mission in the state. According to Reuters, from January 2021, a Portuguese team will be working with Mozambique's government to draw up a strategy to train local soldiers, marines and other forces, arguably a step in the right direction. By partnering with larger, more militarily adept states to train its own forces, Mozambique keeps the kinetic aspect of its counterinsurgency response at a domestic level, thus denying the insurgents the propaganda advantage associated with interventionism from other states. The current trajectory of Mozambique and international cooperation for its counterinsurgency operations is beginning to look promising, however, there is still scope for improvement. If the country manages to quell its insurgency and kickstart its economic development using gas-generated revenue, then it will be in an advantageous geostrategic position, in the same manner as other East African states, such as Djibouti. Despite its current situation, the long-term future of Mozambique is a positive one, providing the state manages its development properly. For analysts, experts and world leaders alike, Mozambique is one state to watch going into the 21st century. Thank you for watching, make sure to check out Reason Rising where you can find more great content from smaller creators. Things are starting to come together for this channel and I have big plans, some of which will be implemented in the coming weeks, so make sure to keep an eye out. Once again, thanks for watching.